Hi, my name's Laurie Cole, and if you had told me about a year ago that I would be writing a Bible study about beauty, I would have said, no way. Beauty, what a shallow topic. But do you know what? I've written a Bible study about biblical beauty, and what God has taught me is that beauty is no shallow topic. In my Bible study, Beauty by the Book, Becoming a Biblically Beautiful Woman, you're going to learn what God taught me the beauty do's and beauty don'ts of becoming a biblically beautiful woman. Now this may sound like a lightweight Bible study, just really six weeks of homework and only like 15 to 20 minutes per day. But what you're going to find is that the message of Beauty by the Book is not lightweight. It is extremely practical. You're going to meet five females on the pages of the Proverbs. First, you're going to meet the immoral woman. Then you're going to meet the indiscreet woman. Thirdly, you're going to meet the irritating woman. Of course, those women are biblical beauty don'ts. But you're also going to meet two other women. You're going to meet the captivating woman and the ideal woman, two women who are definitely beauty do's. I don't know about you, but I'm becoming more and more burdened about the message that the media and the culture are teaching us about beauty. As women, young and old, the media and the culture are teaching us that it's all about physical beauty. You know, the perfect body, the perfect weight, the perfect age, the perfect size. But all of that is just so shallow. And you know what else? It's so temporal. The Bible says that physical beauty fades. But here's one of the very best parts about biblical beauty. Biblical beauty can grow more and more beautiful every year that you grow old. You can become a more biblically beautiful woman every single year of your life. So I invite you to join me for this seven-week study, Beauty by the Book, and you can learn the beauty do's and don'ts of biblical beauty. It's going to be kind of like going to biblical beauty school together. You and I are going to learn the principles, God's standards from His book. It will be our textbook to teach us how you and I can become biblically beautiful women of God. Well, welcome to Beauty by the Book, Becoming a Biblically Beautiful Woman. For the next seven weeks, you and I are going to learn the biblical beauty standard that God has in His Word, the book. You know what? You may not think you are, and sometimes I think I'm not very um, affected by the culture and by the definitions of beauty in the culture, but when I go back in my mind and I begin to think through the generations and through the decades in which I grew up, I can think back that even as a child, I was affected by the way the culture defines physical beauty. But you know what? If you had told me that I would be standing here right now as an adult teaching a course on beauty, I probably would have told you what a shallow subject. But you know what? It's not a shallow subject. It's something that affects us as women from the time we're little girls all the way up until we're older women. And what I want to do tonight is just to show you how serious a topic this really is. And I want you to go with me kind of on a little road trip, a little trip down memory lane. And I want to take you back, and you may not remember these, these people very much, but I can remember the first uh, pictures that affected me, the first... Uh, definitions of beauty in my life was when I was about four or five years old. And I remember going over to my grandmother's house. And at my grandmother's house, there were these two oval pictures hanging above a bed. And then those two oval pictures were the most beautiful women I had ever seen. They were voluptuous women, okay? They were women with big bouffant hair. They were women with perfect, flawless skin. And I would look at those women and I would think as a little bitty girl, I would think, oh, I hope those are my relatives, and I hope I'm going to look like them one day. That's what I would think. But you know what? As I got older, I found out those women were not my relatives. Those were just prints of some women who set the standard for beauty back around the turn of the century. Around 1900, there were women called the Gibson Girls. Have you ever heard of the Gibson Girls? Well, the Gibson Girls were these just absolutely beautiful women. And they were the women who defined the definition of beauty around the turn of the century. So much has changed, though, since the Gibson Girls, haven't it? Those beautiful, voluptuous women, those women, those curvy figures, 
The next woman that I remember was in the 60s when I was growing up, and she, I was probably six or seven years old. She wasn't anything like the Gibson girls, but she was making an absolute new definition of what beauty was. She was a little bitty tiny stick of a girl. She was a model who had big eyes and a little short pixie haircut. She had no waist. She was straight up and down. Do you remember who I'm talking about? Who was that? That was Twiggy, wasn't it? Remember Twiggy? She was no Gibson girl, was she? And I saw her, and I was just a little girl, and I thought, I want to dress like Twiggy. I want to look like Twiggy, you know? And back then, I could, because I was straight up and down. Of course, I could look like her. Well, I can also think about, at that time, uh, there was a television program on in 1965. I would have been seven years old, and I tell you this just to say how affected that you and I are, even from the time we're little bitty girls, how we're affected by the culture's influence and their definition of beauty. But in 1965, there was a program on, and there was a woman in there, and she played a female detective. She was some kind of a something. She had blonde hair. She wore very tight clothing. She had for a pet, I believe it was a jaguar or a panther or something. Do you remember who she was? Her name was Honey West. Honey West. And she, to me, was the coolest of the cool. The coolest thing about her for me and the most beautiful thing about her was this. She had this beauty mark, like right here. Her name was Anne Francis, the actress who played Honey West, and I don't even know if that was a real beauty mark, but I so wanted a beauty mark that I can remember sneaking into my mother's makeup drawer and getting her eyebrow pencil and just walking around, you know, with the beauty mark. I'm sure I looked really cute at six and seven with the beauty mark. But you know what? The culture, it really does impact us. It really does influence us. Think about the 70s. Who were the beauty icons of the 70s? Do you remember who she was? Do you remember? And everybody had to get their hair layered and everybody had to have swoopy bangs because everybody was watching who? She was one of those Charlie's Angels, wasn't she? Farrah Fawcett, she was our icon back then and people were affected by it and all of a sudden women wanted to look like her, dress like her, be like her. We're all affected by the culture. Girls in the 80s or 90s, I was pregnant, I was raising kids and I don't really remember all those beauty icons. I kind of stayed away from all that. I was most of the time out to here. But I know some of you remember the 80s and the 90s, and you remember who the beauty icons, who defined beauty in the 80s and the 90s. And one of those women was a girl who was still around. She's a woman now. And she came around, and she taught us how to wear our intimate wear as outerwear. She came along, and she was a rock singer, and her name was Madonna. And she forever changed the absolute standard of the world for beauty, didn't she? And she changed it in a lot of ways for bad, didn't she? She was the icon in the 80s, and pretty much it just continues to change every decade as women come and go on the covers of magazines, on billboards, as the culture continues to show these uh, pictures to us, these images to us of what beauty is. And here's what so many times we do. Not only do we become people who want to be like that, but we look at ourselves, and trust me, the older you get, the more you realize, I can't have a body like that anymore. I can't look like that anymore. And it makes us dissatisfied with ourselves, doesn't it? It makes us sometimes think, well, if I could just have a little plastic surgery, I could have those lips like that movie star does. If I could just have a little enhancement, you know, maybe then I could look like so-and-so. It makes us dissatisfied. And what we do, whether we even realize it or not, is sometimes even Christian women, we begin to buy into the world's definition of physical beauty. And I'll tell you what, it's never ending because it continues to change. Who are the icons today? Well, if I named their names right now, I would probably date this video. But listen, you know who they are. They're on the covers of all the magazines. And what you see about these images is they're going to continue to come after us. And what I'm seeing is that just distresses me so much is not only are women affected by them, but now our teenage girls are as well. And our little girls, just like I was affected by those two pictures of Gibson girls, just like I was affected by Honey West of all things, you know, when I was six or seven years old, who are our little girls seeing today? We know who they're seeing. And I'll tell you what, it absolutely breaks my heart. You know, I raised three sons, and I never got to shop in the girls' department. And I used to just kind of go into, I'd feel kind of kind of bad for myself when I'd go into the girls' department on the way to the boys' department. But do you know what? About 10 years ago, I remember going into the girls' department, and when I saw some of those clothes that were offered for little old bitty girls, 
I thought, thank you, Lord. I don't have to fight those battles with the daughter. You know, I know what some of you face. I've never had to go through it, but I've seen what's hanging on the, uh, in the fashion area for even the little girls these days, and our culture continues to spiral downward, and the, the de definition of beauty, I believe, does too. It just continues to spiral downward and downward and downward, and you and I have been affected by the media, by movies, and by the culture, and you and I in this study are going to begin to look not so much at what the culture standards are, but what we're going to study for the next six weeks is what is God's definition of beauty? What is His standard for beauty? I want to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you this question. I just want you to silently in your head fill in this blank, okay? Here's the question. You fill in the blank. I could be beautiful if... What would you put in that blank? I can only imagine what some of you would put in that blank. Some of you would say, I could be beauty if beautiful if I could lose 25 pounds. Or I could be beautiful if I could just trade these thighs in for somebody else's, you know? Or I could be beautiful if I could just afford a little plastic surgery. Well, do you know what? I don't know what you put in that blank, but here's what I can tell you by the authority of God's Word. It was a lie, whatever it was that you put in that blank. Because God has created each and every one of us, and He sees us as beautiful. You're already beautiful. You're already beautiful. Now, the world's not going to tell you that. The world's going to hold up a standard and see if you can make it, and most of us will never be able to do that. But when God looks at us, listen, He sees us as beautiful. We are His creation. And I just want to encourage you, as we go through this study, for you to begin to become more and more aware of perhaps how the culture has influenced you. What do you think when you stand in front of the mirror? You know, are you disappointed? Are you just uh, frustrated all the time? Have you bought in, perhaps, to the lie that the culture has taught you about beauty and how it is defined? I know I have in times past, and I don't think that you and I really do want to spend the rest of our lives obsessing over our thighs, do we? I don't. I don't want to spend the rest of my life obsessing over the fact that I'm getting wrinkles and things like that. Now, girls, I'm not going to say that uh, you can't be biblically beautiful if you, um, if, you, if you color your hair or if you have plastic surgery or anything like that. I don't, don't worry about that. I am going to continue to cover my roots, okay? I'm going to do that. But what I am going to say is, listen, you and I have got to be aware of how we've bought in to the culture. And when we begin to obsess over the culture's definition of beauty, and you and I, if we're moms, you and I have especially got to be careful that we know God's standard well enough that we can teach our daughters because the culture is so in their face now. We're going to lose the next generation of girls if you and I don't hold up God's standard before them. Well, what we're going to look at today uh, is Ezekiel. And the reason we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel is because what uh, really surprised me when I began to do this study on beauty is that do you know that the book of Ezekiel that word beauty is used more times in the book of Ezekiel than any other book. Seems kind of strange. When I started to study and get ready to do this, this uh, Bible study, I thought, I just couldn't believe when I began to see all the references to beauty in Ezekiel. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to open your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 16. And we're going to look at this passage because in this passage, the word beauty and beautiful are used more times than any place else in the entire Bible. Ezekiel chapter 16, 7 to 13. And what I want you to see is that this topic of beauty and being beautiful is a serious topic, not a shallow topic. It is a topic that you and I need to turn our attention to. And what you see in Ezekiel chapter 16 is you see a record of God's relationship with Israel. And he's going to speak of Israel in this passage as his wife, okay? Because they were in a covenant relationship together. And he's going to describe what happened to their relationship. He's going to show us what he gave to his people that he loved. And then we're going to see what they did with what he gave him. And as we do this, what I want you to do in your Bible, if you have a pen, is circle every time you see the word beauty, okay? And this is just going to show us a picture of why beauty is a serious, serious subject. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16 and drop down to verse 4. And God is speaking here and he's speaking to Israel and he says, And on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. And what he is saying is, when I met you, when I found you, you had nothing 
and you were unwanted, okay? Nobody had ever given you anything. So he's saying, I saw you, and you were unwanted. And then he says in verse 6, six then I passed by, and I saw you kicking about in your blood as you lay there in your blood, and I said to you, live. Now, see, he's telling a story. He's sort of giving a, a, an illustration. He's talking about his relationship then. He's talking about that as, they, as if they were an infant, a small child that someone had abandoned. And he walked by, and he said, I saw you, and I said, live, live. And then he says there in, chapter, in verse 7, he said, and I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew up, and you developed. And here's our first reference to beauty. You grew up and developed, and you became the most beautiful of jewels. Listen, God took the nation of Israel and he made them into the most beautiful nation on earth. Look back in history and you will see, especially during Solomon's day, the nation of Israel had things that no other nation had at that time. They had a beautiful land. They had land. They had uh, the temple. They had beautiful houses and gardens and all kinds of things. And listen, they had come from nothing from nothing, and God is saying, and when I found you, you had nothing, but before long, I had made you the most beautiful of all the nations on the earth. Well, drop down there, and look, you can see all the things that God did for them. In verse 10, it says, I clothed you with an embroidered dress. I put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen. And then in verse 11, he says, I adorned you with jewelry. And we see there in uh, verse uh, 14, what we see, well, really in the first 13 verses, and what I want you to know is this, and I want you, what, we, what I want you to see is this, is that everything that Israel had was a gift of God. And so what we can see here is that beauty, first of all, the first thing you learn about physical beauty is that physical beauty is God-given, okay? It's a gift of God. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It was a good thing that God gave you. He said, I made you the most beautiful of all the, the nations. I was the one who gave you everything you had. And that list there, if you look at all the things God gave them, listen, he says, I gave you the best of the best. I dressed you well. I, I made sure that you, had, you lacked for nothing. And so we see here that God did all these things uh, for them. But then we drop down to verse 14, and we see... Uh, well, really, at the very end of verse 13, he says this, You became what? Very beautiful. And you rose to be a queen. And then in verse 14, it says, And your fame spread among the nations on account of what? Your beauty. Your beauty. You became famous. Why? Because of your beauty. And because of the splendor I had given you, made your beauty perfect, declares the sovereign Lord. What you see then, first of all, is that beauty is God's gift to us. It's a gift of God. But secondly, what you see there in verse 14 is that physical beauty is also attention-getting, okay? Israel's fame spread because they were so beautiful because God had blessed them in so many ways. They became famous throughout the whole world. People came to Israel just to see Solomon, just to see the temple, just to see what God had done there. And physical beauty is so like that, it is attention-getting. Your fame will spread. The women on the covers of the magazine, they're famous, aren't they? They're famed because of the beautiful face they have, because of the beautiful uh, figure they have. It can get a lot of attention, can it? It is attention-getting. That's not meant to be a bad thing. Listen, beauty is not meant to be a bad thing at all, but here's what you have to know. It can also be a danger thing because you will get a lot of attention because of your curves ladies okay you will you're gonna get, get a lot of attention because God has created us physically beautiful and God has created men visually hasn't he and he created us to be a beautiful thing for men to look at and if you're not careful though that beauty God has given you you can begin to crave that attention okay it will get you noticed but I tell you what that doesn't mean it's wrong but it does mean it's a dangerous thing if you let it go to your head and that's exactly what happens in the story of Israel and the beauty God had given them. The next thing you see about physical beauty, and you see the danger of physical beauty, not only is it attention getting, but we see there in verse 15, he says this, you trusted in your beauty. They began to trust in it. First of all, they enjoyed it. It brought them attention. Everybody noticed them. And then he says, here's what happened. You began to trust in your beauty instead of in me. You begin to focus on what you had instead of on the person, the God who gave it to you. So the third thing we see about physical beauty and the greatest danger, I think, about physical beauty is this. It is pride-inducing, okay? 
it can go to your head fast. It can go to your head fast. Israel began to trust in their physical beauty and not in God. And women do the very same thing. Sometimes we can begin to trust in this and we use it to get what we want, don't we? We bat our eyes. We look just a certain way. And a lot of times we use our beauty, don't we? So that we can uh, get what we want. It is something that can keep you pretty uh, proud of yourself. But perhaps the greatest danger about buying into the world's definition of beauty is that it can be, number four, spiritually corrupting. Buying into the world's definition of physical beauty can absolutely corrupt your relationship with the Lord. That is exactly what happened to Israel. It corrupted that relationship that they had. And you see that there in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 15. He says, they trusted in their beauty. And then it says, you used your fame and you became, and this is graphic language, girls, and it goes downhill from here. But it says, you became a prostitute. You began to lavish your favors on anyone who passed by, and your beauty became his. When we begin to give ourselves over to the world's definition of beauty, when we begin to adopt their ways and their definition, what happens is it will come between our relationship with God. It will corrupt us spiritually. If you look at this passage and you look all the way in the next uh, probably 10 verses, and we don't have time to look at them all right now, but you will see a spiral downward in Israel's relationship with God and also you're going to see that it came to the point that something happened that Israel probably would have never imagined that they would do and it's happening today in our culture as well. Israel begins to give their own children over to other gods. They begin to take what God gave them, not only the gifts God had given them and all the beauty, beautiful things that God had given, but they even took their children. It says, you began to give your children to your lovers. You began to let your children be given over to the culture as well. And I certainly see this, don't you, in today's cultures? Moms letting their daughters just, oh, well, I'm just going to throw up my hands. Well, she wants to dress like so-and-so. Well, she wants to look like so-and-so. And what can I do? Listen, if you're a mom and you're a Christian, you cannot allow yourself to buy in to the definition of physical beauty that the culture gives, but you also cannot allow your daughter to buy into that standard as well. Listen, I know it's not easy, and it's easy for me to say because I'm not a, I don't have any daughters. I know that. You're thinking, well, you've got three sons. What's the big deal? I'm just telling you this. Listen, don't, don't, don't. Let the culture standard define your daughter, okay? Hold her up, God's standard. Teach her God's standard from the time she's young. Don't throw your hands up and just give her over. We see this begins to spiral downward. And in verse 25, in Ezekiel chapter 16, it says, At the head of every street, you built your lofty shrines. And it says, finally, you degraded your beauty. And that's what eventually happens. You become a degraded form of the beautiful person that God created you to be. But you know what? This is not the first time that this very same thing happened, the spiral downward in, because of physical beauty and the corrupting powers that happened. Do you know there's another passage, and it's in Ezekiel chapter 28, and I want you to turn there right now because it is kind of sends chills down my spine when I began to look at this. This is the second passage in Ezekiel where the word beauty is used over and over again. It's interesting, so interesting, the way this parallels the passage you and I just studied there in Ezekiel chapter 16. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12, and this passage records the very first time that beauty led to destruction. And watch for the similarities between this fall and Israel's fall that you just saw previously in Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 28, verse 12, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre. Most people believe that the king of Tyre referenced here refers to Satan himself, okay? A created being that God created. And he says, take up a lament about the king of, of Tyre. And he's talking about Satan here. And he says, and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom, and what else? Perfect in what? In beauty. Perfect in beauty. Satan was created originally, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. And you see there in verse 13, 
You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every pre precious stone adorned you. And he lists the way that Satan was attired there in all these beautiful, beautiful uh, gems. Look what God gave him. He made him beautiful just like he'd made Israel beautiful. He clothed him well. He took care of him there. And then it says in verse 14, You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for I so ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God, and you walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. And do you know what? If you go to other passages in Scripture, what you will see is that what happened to Satan was he began to buy into his own beauty, didn't he? He began to read his own uh, headlines. and He began to read his own uh, fan mail, in a sense. And what happened was the beauty that God originally created him with, it went to his head, and it led to his fall, to his destruction. Beauty is attention-getting. It says, till wickedness was found in you. Verse 16, through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence, and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you from among the fiery stones. And then we see in verse 17 this pride-inducing uh, power that beauty has. Your heart became what? Proud. On account of what? There's that word again. On account of your beauty. You got all puffed up at the beauty that I had given you. And where here's the corruption. And you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth, and I made you a spectacle before kings. What is the result of buying into the culture's definition of beauty. Well, I'll tell you what. What we see here, what happened to Satan, what happened to Israel, is if you buy into that, what you're going to do is you're going to find that it, pride always goes before what? A great, big, giant fall. And that's what happened to Satan. And what I find so interesting here is Satan, the original sinner, wants to use the same thing that brought him down to bring us down. He wants us to buy in the culture. He wants us to become all about us and all about making us all that we can be. And we get so caught up in ourselves that eventually we begin to let pride go to our heads and it comes between us. We forget who gave us the beauty that we have and then we are headed for a destructive fall ourselves. Do you think beauty is a shallow topic after looking at these passages in Ezekiel? It's no shallow topic, is it? It's serious business that we're talking about. It's life, and it is death. So the fourth thing about spiritual beauty, or about physical beauty, I'm sorry, is that it is spiritually corrupting. Well, what about biblical beauty? That is going to be our topic, okay? Biblical beauty. What about biblical beauty? Well, first of all, it's going to be very, very different, as you can imagine, from physical beauty. But one of the things they do have in common is this, is that biblical beauty is also God-given. I want you to turn your Bibles to the best definition that I could find for biblical beauty. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. And you're going to see the differences between biblical beauty and the cultural definition of physical beauty. How is biblical beauty different from what the culture calls beautiful. Well, physical beauty and biblical beauty are both God-given. You see there in 1 Peter chapter 3, it says there, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair or the wearing of jewelry or fine clothes. It says instead, it should be that of your what? Your inner self, okay? Now, God has made women physically beautiful. So the very first thing you can put about biblical beauty is that it is God-given. He's made us beautiful. Uh, if you go back to the garden and you go back to creation and you go back to Adam and the original woman Eve, uh, a lot of pastors that I have heard have said that when Adam saw Eve for the first time, you know, it says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and that's what it literally says. But I've heard pastors and I've heard teachers say that really you could sum it all up in our modern day language. And he, when he saw Eve and he saw that fine form standing before him, what he said was, whoa, baby, whoa, baby. Listen. God has made us physically beautiful. It's a God-given thing. But what we see that's so different from God's definition of beauty, from the culture's definition, is what you just, what you're about to see there. It says in verse 4, it says, Don't let it be all about the outward. But he says, Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. The second thing about biblical beauty is that biblical beauty does not seek attention. Okay? Biblical beauty is gentle and quiet, okay? Yes, you will get attention. Yes, you will. All women do. You will get attention, but biblical beauty doesn't seek attention. Biblical beauty is, is quiet and gentle. 
It's not going to be showing off and batting eyes and trying to use it, you know, like so many of us are taught by the culture. Use it, you know, whatever you've got. Just use it for your own benefit. Use it any way you want to. If it helps you, put it out there. Drop that neckline, up that hemline, all that kind of stuff. Listen, the Bible says biblical beauty is not like that. It's gentle, and it's quiet. And the next thing you see about biblical beauty, as you follow that passage, it says that biblical beauty is of great worth, of great value in God's sight. Well, the third thing that we learn about biblical beauty that makes it different from the world's definition of beauty is that biblical beauty is precious in God's sight. You see that there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. He says that biblical beauty is of great worth, of great value. It is precious in God's sight. It is prized by God because biblical beauty has nothing to do with being prideful. That's something, of course, that God hates. But biblical beauty is something that God loves and values. He sees it as something that is precious. But y'all, here's one of my favorite things about biblical beauty, especially since I celebrated my 50th birthday just a couple of months ago. The fourth point about biblical beauty is this, is that biblical beauty is unfading and eternal. Do I hear an amen on that? Isn't that good? Aren't you glad? Listen, do you know what? You can become more biblically beautiful every year that you age. Isn't that good? Aren't you glad about that? I am so thrilled. Listen, physical beauty is always going to fade, isn't it? It is temporal. But y'all, biblical beauty is eternal. It lasts. You can become more and more biblically beautiful every year you live. And I sure see a few of you here right now tonight. I'm so grateful. Listen for that truth that God's beauty, biblical beauty, is unfading. Well, here's our question. How can you and I become biblically beautiful women? How can we, we can't really go into a monastery, we can't really go into a convent, really can we, and get away from the culture. That's not the way to deal with it. But I want you to turn with me to Psalm chapter 27, verse 4, and it's our last passage. But I want you to see the answer to this question. How can you and I become biblically beautiful women. Where do we go to find the true definition? Well, we've seen it in 1 Peter. But here's what we're going to begin to do for the next six weeks. We're going to do what the psalmist tells us to do in Psalm 24. I'm sorry, Psalm 27, verse 4. Psalm 27, verse 4. He says one thing. You need to underline that. One thing. He says this is my number one thing. I have asked from God, and that I shall seek. Underline that too. I have one thing that I'm going to ask God, and there's one thing that I'm going to make my goal to seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to do what? To behold the beauty of the Lord. Now, does that mean I have to die and go to heaven? No, no, that's not what it means. What it means is, is that I would be so single-hearted and so single-focused on God and seeing things from His viewpoint that His beauty would define me, that His beauty would be what I would reflect in my day-to-day -day life, that I would be, in a sense, insulated from the culture because I have made my one thing not to look like some woman who's the it girl of the year, not to live or dress like somebody who the, the media has adopted as the person of the month, the pinup of the month. But my single goal, my focus, my priority is to know God and to seek Him and to behold what He thinks is beautiful and then to reflect that beauty in the culture. So the answer to that question, how can you and I become biblically beautiful women? The answer is this, by beholding God and then by upholding His standard his standard, the standard of his word. Over the next six weeks, girls, you and I are going to keep our gaze on God. We are going to look, take a long look into the book, into the Bible, and we are going to see God's standard for beauty. And as we gaze on the Lord and as we see his word, you're going to begin to learn the biblical principles of how to be a beautiful woman, how you and I can become more and more beautiful every year that we live. 
Well, not long ago, I was in my dentist's office, and I have a real sweet dentist, and he knew I was involved in this Bible study, Beauty by the Book. We were piloting at our church, and he'd heard about it. His wife and I are kind of friends, and he said, I hear you're doing a Bible study about beauty. Is that what it's about? And he thought it was kind of a silly topic. And we began to talk, and, and you know, he's mostly doing most of the talking because they have all those instruments and stuff stuck in your mouth, you know. And uh, he's a funny guy, and he said, you know, uh, Women just never get over wanting to be beautiful, do they? Just kind of, you just is something, I mean, men don't care, seem as much. And he just kind of was talking and talking, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And then he began to tell me a story, and it was an aha moment for me. He didn't know it, but what he did was he gave me a story that I'm going to share with you. And to me, it just uh, kind of clarifies what you and I are called to do. He said he has an 80-some-odd-year-old grandmother who lives out in a little tiny town in East Texas. She can't drive anymore, but every week she goes to the grocery store because her granddaughter is able to come by and pick her up and take her to the grocery store. The first time that the granddaughter went by to pick up her 80-some-odd-year-old grandmother, she went in the house, and she couldn't find her, and she made her way back to the bedroom, and there was her grandmother, all dolled up. She had on her nice dress. She had her makeup on. Her hair was done. She looked like she was ready for her close-up. I mean, she just looked beautiful. And the granddaughter was standing there in her jeans and her T-shirt, and she said, Grandma, why are, you so gro why are you so dressed up just to go to the grocery store? And that grandmother straightened up, and she said, Well, somebody's got to set the standard. You know what? I like that. I like that. And girls, here's the truth. Somebody's got to set the standard in our culture, and it better be us. And we had better hold up God's standard because right now the culture has put up a standard that is going to destroy women, young and old. But you and I have a standard from God's Word, and He's given it to us, and somebody's got to uphold that standard. Will you do that with me? Will you learn these principles of biblical beauty? Will you hang in with me for six weeks, and will you commit to look into the book, to gaze at the beauty of the Lord, and then to see what He teaches you and and apply it to your life and then live it out in this culture. Teach it to your daughters if you have daughters. Teach it to your sons if you have sons. Listen, but live it out in the culture so that you and I could make a difference for God in this culture. Somebody's got to set the standard, and it needs to be you and me. Biblical beauty is God's goal for us. Girls, let's commit to, to being women who uphold that standard. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we thank you that you love us enough to tell us the truth. We thank you for the truths that you've given us about biblical beauty even tonight. And Father, we pray that we would take these with us, that we would hide them in our heart, that we would commit ourselves to upholding your standard and not buying in to the world's standard. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you see us as beautiful. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.